blessing to be back in our sanctuary today. Last week and uh, a couple of times, I've uh, un been able, unable to come because of health concerns and, and infection, you know, uh, isolation. So, um, so we're back in the sanctuary, and it's beautiful and much more appropriate for worship. So I am personally glad, and I hope that that helps all of us in our worship. Um, in terms of announcements, the only thing that I want to mention is that we are working on uh, some sort of group con conversation method. Um, some people have suggested Zoom, but there's some security issues there. We tried a free conference call, but we ended up with business signals and that didn't work out. So we're, we're working on that problem, and hopefully uh, early next week we'll find something that can allow us to do more fellowship together and to see each other. Uh, together and so look for more on that in your inboxes and your email and uh, also I want to mention that uh, by the time you see this you may already have received or will shortly receive your newsletter for the month of May and so thanks to Beth and for all those who've contributed and there have been a lot of contributors this time for that um, so look for your newsletter in your inbox or or um, in the mail and uh, and so we continue to serve one last announcement that I'd like to make, and that is that we have been instructed that the um, ACTC, the Cowson Church's cooperative that offers a um, food pantry, is running very low. And so if you're able to help, I would encourage you to do so. It is important that we not forget that uh, hunger and need are even more real now than they have been in the past in our neighborhood. And so any support we can give at this point is really especially important. So if you're able to do that, I would encourage you to do so at this time. Thanks, and we'll press on with our worship. shared broadly with the congregation, then communicate with Beth at the office, either by phone or email or however you'd like to do that. And, uh, and we can, which she, she is keeping a, a very up-to-date list and keeping it uh, circulated. So, so that's the way to get that 
word out because we don't because we can't gather together and share person to person. But in general, um, we're living in a time when there are well over two million uh, persons affected by or infected, I should say, confirmed to be infected by this disease. Um, the United States has got over six hundred thousand thousands of deaths. And it is certainly time for us to be praying for caregivers and for the ill and for their families, um, families of both, really. But also persons we may not even think of as sort of quite so directly involved, but who are in a significant way um, acting as heroes. So the people that sweep the floors in the hospitals, that cook the meals in the hospital kitchens, that that drive the trucks, that bring the food to the grocery, the people that work at the grocery, stocking the shelves and are exposed to a great many people coming in and going. The people at, uh, at the, the stores that are open who are exposed to the public in a great many different ways. So a great many people for whom we need to pray and for whom we should be thankful. And so for all those who serve in any capacity that puts them at risk at this time, it's certainly an act of courage on their part to continue to serve and so, thank you for that, and uh, we will thank God for you as well. We also uh, want to just be in prayer for those leaders who are deciding what and how we should behave and what we should do and how we should act. It's not simple, and we're working it out as we go. And so an awful lot of armchair quarterbacking and second guessing can be occurring, is occurring, and yet we need, God, your wisdom for those who are forced to choose without perfect knowledge. So if, uh, let's be in prayer for them as well. And then finally, I, I think that we should be in prayer for those who are isolated in so many different ways. People, all of us, are in, in a significant way living in a different world than we're accustomed to or than that we anticipated. It is a time when we cannot gather face to face, and so many are feeling all sorts of effects and implications of that. So many of us are, well, dealing with some cabin fever and some dislocation and separation. You know, each day seems so much like the next and so much like the one that went before that it's hard to keep our bearings and our focus to stay connected and to stay healthy. In a high anxiety time and isolation, let us be in particular in prayer for those who have um, addictive personalities and who are um, at high risk to unhelpful behaviors um, in an environment like this one. So let us keep them in our prayers as well. Now let's take some time to go to God in prayer. God, we thank you for so many people doing so many things to make life work, to care for the sick, to keep as few as possible infected and keep everybody else from getting infected as, as that is possible. We thank you, God, for all those who are risking themselves to keep grocery stores functioning in full and people fed and life proceeding. We thank you, God, for the people that are running the soup kitchens and that are running the food pantries because so many more are unable to afford to purchase the food they need, and yet they still get hungry. So for people who feed and care for the needy, we ask a special blessing. God, we ask also your guidance and leadership and protection for those who are in positions where they must choose. Guide them in their thinking and in their lives that they might be wise beyond the knowledge that we have to live in a prudent and appropriate ways and to guide us all as we seek faithfulness in our pursuit of life. in these hard times. And finally, God, we ask a special measure of grace and blessing for all those who are 
all of us really, who are experiencing so much extra stress and anxiety these days, who are isolated and, and finding it maybe hard to, uh, to maintain equilibrium and health in a time like this. So be with us, God, and help us. Guide us and protect us. Show us how we can be faithful, and we will seek to be your children, thanking you for all of your good gifts, even in a hard time like this one, and praying as you have directed us to do. And in particular, God, we want to thank you for the greatest gift ever given, the gift of Jesus, who in this day and every day is always the greatest gift we have ever or will ever receive. And so we conclude our prayer with the words that he taught us when he prayed. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. I believe he is the Son of God I believe he died and rose again I believe he paid for us all And I believe he's here now Standing in our midst Here with the power to heal now And the grace to forgive I believe in you, Lord I believe you are the Son of God I believe you died and rose again I believe you paid for us all And I believe you're here now Standing in our midst Here with the power And the grace to forgive And I believe you're here now Standing in our midst Here with the power to heal now And the grace to forgive. From Psalm 16. Protect me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. I have no good apart from you. As for the holy ones in the land, they are the noble, in whom is all my delight. Those who choose another God multiply their sorrows. Their Drink offerings of blood I will not pour out, or take their names upon my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The boundary lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I have a goodly heritage. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also my heart instructs me. I keep the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be moved. Therefore my heart is glad, and my soul rejoices. My body also rests secure. For you do not give me up to Sheol, or let your faithful ones see the pit. You show me the path of life. 
In your presence there is fullness of joy. In your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Amen. This is a reading from the, from, uh, the New Testament, First Peter, part 1, then parts 3 through 12. A living hope. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his great mercy, he has given us a new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who are being protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice, even if now for a little while you have had to suffer various trials, so that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable, is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Although you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and rejoice with indescribable and glorious joy. For you are receiving the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. As we begin to look at our scripture, let's take a little bit of time to begin with prayer. Pray with me. God, we thank you for this day and for this chance to gather together. We thank you for your word that inspires and encourages and uplifts. And we ask God that as we together come to it this day, that you would help us to discover energy, strength, hope, purpose, and calling. That we might live these unusual days faithfully and well, according to your will and purpose, and that we might remember whose and who we are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In our letter from Peter, we find the words of a fisherman. Paul was a teacher and a rabbi and, and, and sometimes pretty sophisticated in the way that he talked and thought and shared. Peter was much less so. Peter was much more direct. Fishermen tend not to be people who focus on uh, the details and the niceties. They tend to be focused on the main thing and keeping the main thing the main thing. So sometimes when I read Peter, uh, it can seem underwhelming because it is so straightforward. But it's also refreshing. So in Peter we have, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. By his mercy he gave us new birth and an inheritance with Christ in the resurrection. And yet, then, we have this piece that is where I'll focus. We are being protected by the power of God through faith and salvation, ready to be revealed at the end. But in this you rejoice, even if now, for a little while, 
you have had to suffer various trials. So that the genuineness of your faith, being more precious than gold, that though perishable is tested by fire, may be found result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus is revealed. You know, I want to talk about in this the notion of testing. Teachers know that a test is for a really specific purpose. Testing is not to torture the children. I mean, the, the bumper stickers that say, as long as there are tests, there will be prayer in schools is, is cute and fun. But the purpose of a test, the purpose of a test is to give you an opportunity to demonstrate your understanding. Not just to, to give you that opportunity, but to know that you understand it because you can use it upon demand. And that's what the test is for, is to give you focus in attempting to learn, but also an opportunity to use what you've learned in an environment of pressure so that you can discover whether you really know it or not. Because you see, so many times when we are untested, we don't really know what we know. We don't really know how we'll respond under pressure. In fact, all of basic training and all of the military's training around that is, a, a, is, a, is, is by nature and intention a test. A test to give us the opportunity to discover how strong and how ready we are for a real environment of stress. And of course, in the military, that real environment of stress is going to happen all the time, especially if they're ever deployed and in harm's way. And so you must know, you must have experienced sufficient stress to determine whether the training has taken hold. Because that training may not just determine whether or not you live or die, but whether your platoon lives or dies, your battalion, even your country. And so the test is to get you ready to perform at need. The test is to give you confidence that you do know how to perform at need and when the time is right. In the same way that an athlete may, against a clock, know how fast they are. And yet until they enter the race and compete with other people, they won't know how fast they are until the test comes and the trial. The race, the throw, the wrestling. It's hard to know how much you know until you put it to the test. And so our faith is just like that. In our faith, we think to ourselves in easy times, well, of course I have a great faith. I go to church and I pray for people and I you know, make a contribution in the offering plate and, and life is simple and I'm doing putting in the work, doing the job. But then something comes along and we discover, well, that in easy times, you don't know how strong that faith is. You discover the strength of your faith and the strength of your preparation when it's put to the test, when it's time to discover what you have learned, and to demonstrate it, not just for someone else, but for yourself, to discover what lessons you have mastered and where more work is needed. Our faith is no different than learning math in that sense, or, or in English, or history, or any other subject. We learn the material in a relatively low-stress environment, and we do that because that's the best way to pick it up. We do it in a, maybe in a quiet room or with the radio playing, as you prefer, but you study in a low-stress environment to absorb as much material and information and, and to master it as you can, but then you have to demonstrate it in production, in testing, and in an environment of stress. Only then will you know what you really have absorbed inside and what you only thought you figured out uh, but didn't get deep enough or well enough to produce that need. Our faith is exactly the same. We test or are tested and then discover the strength and weakness of our faith. 
Now, that doesn't mean that we should look forward to the tests, especially of our faith. My mother once warned me when I was a child to be careful what I pray for, because I might get it. And in particular, she warned me to be careful about praying for patience, because there's only one way to develop that. Well, I don't know about that, but I will say this. It is in a time like this, when anxiety is high and fears are running the streets, when the, when the news is filled with doom and gloom and the numbers are counting alarmingly every day and we find ourselves in stress, that we discover where our hope lies and how strong our faith is. We have been given an inheritance with Christ in resurrection. But resurrection, resurrection comes only to those who die. And so Christ was raised from the dead and into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. We say that when things are easy, and then we test or are tested when times are hard. Do we believe it? Do we know it? Are we ready? to rely on it when we cannot stand in our own strength. Well, it's like this, Peter says. Things that are important and valuable must be refined. They must be tested. Like gold, but even more precious than gold. But how is gold refined? Well, you heat it up. You heat it up until it melts, and then you let it come out of the stone that it's embedded in, impregnated into, and separate off all the not gold from it. And that's when you get the pure, refined gold. In the same way, Peter says, our lives, when we find ourselves in difficult times, in struggles and in testing, well, we are refined. And the genuineness of our faith is revealed. Now is a time of testing, not for each of us individually only, but for all of us together. Who are we when the chips are down? Who will we rely on, and then where will we find our hope? What will we do with the gifts and blessings that God has given us? Will we share them, or will we hoard them against potential future need? Now is the time when in our lives and in our responses to the world that we experience and the stress and the suffering and the struggle that is our stalking our streets, we discover, we discover what is real and what matters and we reveal to ourselves and to our world what is real and what matters. Because what we want is something as strong and pure and clean as what Jesus had in the resurrection. A kind of power that is undefiled, imperishable, unfading. A kind of faith that is just like that. A resurrection faith that is strong enough to face even death. And come out pure and strong and hopeful, and trusting. And we, although we have not seen him, we love him. Even though we don't see him now, we believe in him and rejoice with an indescribable and glorious joy. For we are receiving the outcome of our faith salvation of our souls and the hope for life even after death. It is a time of trial. Rise to meet it with God's help. Amen.